Hi, I'm Doug Smith. Uh, I supervise the wolf, bird, and elk programs in Yellowstone National Park. And I've been in Yellowstone since 1994 and was hired to reintroduce wolves. I inherited birds and elk in 2012, excuse me, 2008. Uh, and arguably wolves and elk have always been together anyways. And I'm gonna try and make this uh, talk short and sweet but whatever I don't get to was published in this book you see on the screen, Yellowstone Wolves, Science and Discovery in the World's First National Park. This sums up our first 25 years of research. This came out in December 2020 at the height of the COVID pandemic. Um, so I don't know how sales have been, but we worked really hard to summarize everything that we've learned in the first 25 years <clears throat> but this is the wolves historic range you can see yellowstone in the red uh, rectangle but wolves are one of the most widespread mammals in the world northern hemisphere only and they had a problem in that by the 1960s their range was much reduced and they were eliminated from yellowstone and this is largely because we had a cultural bias against them. This is our conservation president, Teddy Roosevelt, who referred to the wolves as the beast of waste and desolation. And this pretty much has been the problem that wolves have had throughout history. Uh, they've had a negative connotation to them. They are considered the antithesis of civilization. They conflict with livestock. They conflict with hunting. Uh, for big game. Um, they are falsely accused of being a human safety threat. And so a lot of people have issues with wolves. And so that led to their eradication. So there's a lot of misinformation out there, a, a lot of fables, stories. Wolves are famous for this. Little Red Riding Hood, Three Little Pigs, uh, Wolf in Sheep's Clothing, and on and on. So people have a cultural bias against them. So besides restoring wolves to Yellowstone, we're one of the higher profile wolf programs in the world. And a big thing we're trying to do is get the proper information out there. And that is a big goal of my talk. And hence your goal for interacting with the public comes to Yellowstone. And by the way, I did meet with Teddy Roosevelt's great grandson one afternoon in my office. And I, I had to ask, would he still call wolves the beasts of waste and desolation? And he said, I don't think he would now. But that was his cultural bias, uh, you know, 120 years ago. So, and, and this is Yellowstone Park, 1930s. That's actually a coyote pelt. But you get the idea uh, of, of predator hatred at that time. And Yellowstone's founded 1872. They had a predator removal program at that time, which included wolves, cougars, coyotes, bobcats, lynx, wolverine, you know, predators were bad. Bears were spared because some early administrators liked them and they have a different uh, history. And Kerry Gunther will probably talk about that. And Yellowstone became famous because of bears. Uh, but in terms of wildlife, predators were eliminated. And that had big ecological effects, and I'll talk about that later. Because nature is constructed between top-down forces, which is predators, preying on ungulates, which prey on plants, and that's called a trophic cascade, versus bottom-up forces, which sun feeds into plants, plants feed the ungulates, elk and deer, bison, which feed the carnivores. And these two forces have been in yin and yang for as long as ecosystems have existed, millions of years, um, and here since the last ice age. And we've wiped out that top layer in Yellowstone Park at its establishment in 1872. And so the Park Service was unaware of these ecological forces. They were founded in 1916 and mostly on scenic beauty or land that couldn't be used for economic benefit. That's how the early parks got established. So wiping out predators really meant nothing to them because we didn't know what we did. And it was just about setting aside land for something to do in for people. And so that really set us on a different trajectory. And so why do we have these problems with wolves? And because I don't have a lot of time, we can boil it down by saying they kill. 
and that means they compete with us because we also kill and they kill the same things that we do and second wolves are not backyard wildlife they're not raccoons skunks white-tailed deer black bears they need space you know what's a viable population probably hundreds of wolves what's the minimum size a wolf pack can live on probably a couple hundred square miles you multiply that out average pack size 10 at least for this region and you have thousands of square miles and you know we don't want to spare that kind of country Yellowstone 2.2 million acres roughly 3600 square miles 9,000 kilometers squared approximately and some people wondered is that big enough for wolves and so I think really this brings up fundamental questions for folks like you who are uh, educating people about Yellowstone who love Yellowstone but really what is intact nature what's an ecosystem what's a national park here for and can you have it when you don't have all the native inhabitants all of the, the native wildlife is that really a pristine or a park set aside and so that's an open question because some people would say sure yeah we want to pick the animals and plants that we want to have and other people say nature should exist separate from humanity and that is really what the National Park Service policy is built on uh, now currently and you know without this this animal this hard to live with animal fully acknowledge that but what is it like without them the howl of the wolf is by for many the, the quintessential sound of the wilderness certainly there's others loons uh, you, you know a lot of other different animals um, they feel is the sound of the wilderness but certainly wolves is up there with them and so why Yellowstone wolves were also reintroduced to central Idaho at the same time uh, 1995 96 35 wolves were uh, released in central Idaho that population has taken hold now as well there's a sustainable viable population of wolves in Idaho uh, wolves came down to northwest Montana uh, Glacier Park and the surrounding wilderness and national forest they immigrated naturally from Canada and then we reintroduced wolves in Yellowstone 1995 96 and 97 three years as opposed to Idaho's two we got 14 in 1995 from Alberta 17 in 1996 from British Columbia and 10 in 1997 from Choteau Montana so we had a total of 41 wolves and this area was chosen for one because Yellowstone uh, is the second largest national park in the lower 48 so a lot of space but what makes it even more special is the public land around it and that is key for any debate about wolves right now is public land and so wolves are being dis uh, going to be reintroduced in Colorado that was a voter initiative this last November 2020 um, because there's a lot of public land there Mexican wolves in New Mexico Arizona also the centerpiece of that project is based on public land so this is a very important habitat requirement for wolves not that they uh, uh, can't live with people or on private land but expanses of public land reduce conflict and they usually have adequate prey and separation from humans although a long-term problem going forward for the greater Yellowstone ecosystem is this area's population is growing a lot of it private land and things like grizzly bears and cougars and wolves all live here now and have restored populations and so that will be an issue moving forward but this area depicted here on the map is one of the largest complexes of wildland undisturbed in the temperate zone uh, in the world so I'm not talking about Arctic or tropical forests but you know the swath of area that goes across the middle of the globe which by the way most people live you know United States Western Europe Middle East Asia a ton of people live in this middle swath mid latitudes um, and this area GYE is one of the wildest systems in that region and so this made it a logical poise place for recovery and so this is literally wolf number one being brought in January 12 1995 that's the Secretary of the Interior 
That's the late director of the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Molly Beatty, who sadly passed away two years after this photo was taken. Mike Phillips, the original product leader, uh, he went on to work for Turner Endangered Species Fund. But this is number one coming in. This was a big deal. Uh, Native Americans who claimed to have had a relationship uh, with wolves that preceded European humans' uh, relationship with wolves. Uh, one that was entirely eradication. Native Americans uh, did not share that view, although they did harvest and use wolves as a natural resource. Uh, many tribes were uh, joyful that wolves were coming back. Uh, these two gentlemen on the right uh, came to pray for the wolves' return and have returned every year since uh, to pray for them uh, uh, in their cultural tradition. And so here's number seven. A, a, a Rose Creek wolf, one of the first wolves to come back, uh, first shipment of wolves, January 12, 1995. Jim Pico took this photo uh, looking at her through the shipping crate. Wonder what her thoughts are there. And so a big part of this was this kind of cultural tradition or trajectory of anti-wolf attitudes, all predators are bad, had to change for wolves to come back. Uh, yes, it's Park Service policy now to restore uh, natural systems to their original uh, state and then let nature take its course with minimal human intervention. But this could not have been done without um, human attitudes changing. We have not grown more wildlife habitat in Yellowstone. Uh, in fact, there's probably less than there was when wolves were eradicated. Last wolf was killed in Yellowstone 19. 26 so it was roughly a 70 year absence and so it was the changing of mind so what you folks are doing is very very important uh, communicating with people uh, real data real stories about wolves and and i don't know how people's minds change in this culture but that's a very important thing and by the way not everybody's mind has changed i'm in my 27th year here in yellowstone and I still get calls and emails about people who think this was a terrible idea, they hate it, they want the wolves removed, they want the wolf population reduced, whatever it may be. Um, these, these ancient cultural biases against predators are still in place, especially wolves. So how have we done? Uh, this is a population graph going back to 1995. Uh, the tallest bars are the a park population and the dark blue is the uh, northern part of the park which is only 10 percent of Yellowstone but for about half the time wolves have been back um, had half the wolves and this is a low elevation river it's largely described uh, low elevation area largely described by the Yellowstone River drainage it's a very famous area called the northern range it's the wintering area of the northern Yellowstone elk um, because it's lower elevation, there's more elk, deer, and bison here in the winter. And so that has been a very important area to, to wolves, cougars, bears, the entire park history. Uh, the, the lighter green is the park interior. And so up to about 2007, there were more wolves in the north um, than in the interior. So 10% of the park's area had over half the wolves. And this has switched, except for the last two years, um, and mostly been stable since 2008. So you see those first 10 or so years, the population grew rapidly. It declined three times, uh, 1999, 2005, 2008. And after 99 and 2005, both times the population bounced back. Um, it declined because of a disease called distemper that killed uh, most of the pups, um, but they bounced back both times. Um, the third time distemper hit, the population did not bounce back. And that suggests a different limiting factor. And that's probably food. Wolves have come into equilibrium with their food supply. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Since that time, the population has been flat. We've called that phase two. Um, versus the other part where it shot up and bounced around, we call it phase one. 
and it's been largely flat since that time except this last year uh, our count in um, December 2020 was up we've hovered around 100 wolves in about 10 packs um, 2019 we had 94 wolves this last year December 2020 we had 123 wolves in nine packs and so that's a blip up and so far we've had a hard time explaining why and that might be because of just three very large packs Junction, 8 Mile and Wapiti and they all had good pup production it was just an odd year and it bumped numbers up this year to 123. Now we just finished in March 2021 our annual winter study um, and so these are unofficial figures um, and we weren't flying with the pilot uh, normally we do because of COVID pilot was flying by himself we had one ground crew out every day doing counts and so our March numbers for these packs uh, 8 mile was 21 junction is 22 remember they were 35 at the end of December the pack split into two groups the main groups 22 a split off group is 10 and then the phantom lake pack which we do not have any functional collars in is 14 and those are our March counts and then Wapi that goes between the northern range and the interior has uh, 18. Um, our other counts um, Carnelian Creek which we have listed that's the pack in green here um, is no longer there they're probably gone but eight mile phantom junction Wapiti are still in place Molly's is an interior pack they do occasionally come to the northern range they had no pups in 2020 they're seven wolves the Cougar Creek pack we've lost collars is in disarray we were only able to track one wolf all winter we were not able to get any new collars in that pack this winter so we don't know what they're going to do uh, a new pack down here called Heart Lake um, six wolves two adults uh, four pups um, left the park excuse me three adults four pup, three pups left the park this winter and went out towards Matitsi and the state of Wyoming collared all six of them so if they come back to this region in the summer we should be able to track them very well and then of course this circle means like Phantom Lake we have no functional collars and we can't track them and that's the Beckler pack which is for all adults no pups uh, we aren't sure if those pups were uh, killed by human harvest or not but without collars we're only left with remote cameras a student uh, from Utah State did his masters on this pack Aaron bought but most of the work was done by tracking skiing and remote cameras this is a look of from, this is a page in our book I encourage you to visit our book and see this in greater detail but this is the progression of, of territories through uh, about 20 years and you can see the northern part of the park as I mentioned is very important to wolves there's more year-round prey there uh, there's more clustering of territories and wolf activity there there's areas in the map that are blank but you can see how packs come and go through the years some of this is due to habitat some of this is due to um, individual packs having greater ability to control territory um, you know call it what you will culture whatnot but this is a great look over a 20-year period of how things change but also how things don't and so we spend a lot of time uh, tracking these wolves the most important thing we do all year is we, we go out annually and collar the wolves uh, we handle them then we track them this is a, a look at the uh, helicopter operation the handling we're able to attach a radio collar to them at this time and follow them and this is how we do the counts and gather the data that are presented in the book and I use for this talk uh, a big issue if you live in Idaho Montana Wyoming you hear about it in the legislature when they're in session uh, it's just a constant issue that won't go away and it's you know what do wolves do to elk and most wolf studies worldwide for sure North America are, are looking at wolf impacts on prey 
this is a flashpoint in Alaska. It's a flashpoint in Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota. And so we have to look at this and be prepared to address these issues. And one issue that we had, as I mentioned earlier in Yellowstone, is, is we eliminated all the carnivores. The elk population grew. Um, they impacted the vegetation. Uh, the, the big issue was woody vegetation, cottonwood, willow, aspen. The grasses and forbs are a separate subject. But, you know, this was the debate for the entire middle part of the 20th century. And, and most people felt that the, the elk population was higher than it should be, higher than the long-term average, overpopulated. And this had impacts, as you can see here, on the woody vegetation. It was suppressed for for decades during the middle part of the 20th century. And, you know, elk were the big issue in Yellowstone, middle 20th century. Um, we had a different approach to them. Here's uh, how people were dealing with elk. And, uh, you know, when, I don't know the exact time period for this photo, but you could guess as well as I could, mid 20th century. And without predators, um, there were too many elk. And what we had to do, this is a historic photo from the archives is from 1923 to 1968, approximately 77,000 elk um, were killed um, by hunters in Montana as they crossed the line. They were shipped by Yellowstone National Park at the train station that came into Gardner to uh, many Western states, Mexico, Canada, to repopulate ranges that had been, um, where elk had been reduced due to market hunting. Um, and they were killed inside the park, as depicted here, because there were no predators. Wolves were eliminated, cougars were eliminated, they were killed off by the 1930s, bear numbers were reduced. So the top-down forces I talked about were not in place. So the park took it upon themselves to control elk. And so we were not able to do an elk count this year uh, due to COVID. So that last bar is the, for you folks that were here last year, the last bar is the same. But this takes elk numbers back. This is just the northern herd. Uh, there's seven, maybe eight elk herds that use Yellowstone. Uh, I won't get into a discussion of all of them, but keep in mind, Yellowstone is mostly summering elk habitat. You know, too much snow, harsh weather. The elk leave and go to winter range, mostly outside the park, and then move back into high elevation in the summer and summer here and leave. And so this is just the most studied herd, the northern herd, and it goes back to 1960. You can see that this is the period of the control. I mentioned the control ended in 1968. Once that happened with no predators, the elk population took off. We reintroduced wolves here. And since it's been declining, it's declined since then. And this has all been blamed on wolves. And this is a very complex story, but the bottom line is, I don't have much time, is this is due to not just wolves, but cougars. They recovered as well. A growing population of black and grizzly bears and management by the state of Montana outside the park to reduce the size of the elk population. They did uh, nuisance hunts where they were killing on average a thousand female elk every winter from about the mid 1970s um, to about 2008, 2009. They thought there were too many elk, they were damaging the range. And so all of these forces together, in other words, a multi-causal decline of elk, not just wolves, which you will hear from everybody, caused this to get to this point now. And we estimate it, this is actual counted elk. And it's well known that you miss elk and it's thought to be an average you miss of about 30 percent so you see about 70 percent it can be as bad as 50 percent that you see but we estimate the herd now between six and eight thousand elk which is less than here which was estimated about 25,000 elk but the idea of less and more in nature is very relevant you, you don't want to manage for the maximum like you know, we manage for the economy to be the maximum. Na nature's not like that. And so a lot has changed. This is the uh, wolf population initially took off and stabilized. This is the elk population, which we just talked about, which has very high come down, 
but the two, as you can see, red line, blue line, have been in equilibrium roughly for the last 10 or so years. I know that equilibrium is a slippery word. A lot of colleges don't like it, just trying to make a point that the system's more stable now than it was. But bison is the green line, and that's been the big change. Since I've been here, 1994, there used to be 500 bison in the Northern Range. Now there's over 3,000. That's been a big change. How will the wolves adapt? How will the system adapt? And the bison office, Chris Jeremiah, PJ White, are working on this. But So the book we wrote is the first 25 years. What's the next 25 going to look like? And bison are going to play a big part of that, for sure. And so here to summarize, maybe I should have this at the beginning. What's the big deal? Um, well, and they compete with us for space, livestock, and big game. Uh, through time, rabid wolves used to attack people. Very rarely do healthy wolves. Certainly, they're, they're the least dangerous large carnivore compared to, say, cougars and bears. But people still have these myths that wolves are dangerous. Very easy to live with them. And then this just view of the world. How do you view the world? Are we supposed to share the planet with other creatures? Or is the planet here for us? And what you decide on that issue is what you're going to decide about wolves. And if you like them or not, and you know, you get really upset about wolf recovery, or you think wolf recovery is really cool. And you know, that's about half the world, as best I can judge, sitting at my desk for the last 27 years. But they have had big ecosystem impacts. We know that. And for one, the return, we have had a, a resurgence of willow and aspen. Um, long story, not enough time to explain. There's a chapter in it in our book. It's the longest chapter in the book. It was the hardest chapter in the book because the goal was to get people that disagree, super hard in this day and age, as you know, to work together on the same book chapter. This is extraordinarily difficult. I won't take you to the stories. I'm watching the clock. I'm almost out of time. But most folks are in agreement that there has been a response of willow and aspen. I'll leave cottonwood out for now. Um, this has mostly been due to less elk browsing, but other factors. The primary one is adequate moisture. And with increased primarily willow, you get more beavers and you get more songbirds. Uh, those two birds uh, on, the, on the right, the gray bird, that's a willow flycatcher, and down below, that's a Wilson's warbler, are really increasing on our bird surveys. We didn't see as many of these two species 20 years ago because they like willow and willow has really come on. So this, these are the trophic effects that we're talking about. And there's many, many more. We just don't have studies on them. These are two big things that we've studied. And then another one is, is, is the, the scavenging. Wolves make kills, uh, you know, cougars do too. And there is scavenging use of cougar kills, but not as much as wolf kills. And a big one is grizzly bears, especially during low white bark uh, uh, pine nut years because that's a key food for grizzly bears in the fall. Last year, 2020, was a big white bark year, limber pine too. And so the bears eat the nuts. They go to high elevation, they eat them. When that doesn't happen, they steal wolf kills more. We've got data on this. And many other species use wolf kills. So this is a big ecosystem effect that wolves have. Some would say keystone species. It's had big, big people have loved this story. The story of wolves returning to Yellowstone is a worldwide story. Um, John Duffield, the University of Montana, an economist, did a study. It's getting to be a little bit old, about 15 years ago. But $35 million of economic activity benefits the gateway communities because of people coming here to see wolves. That was his economic analysis. It's, it's a big deal. Um, people really, and this is a shot I took from the airplane, when wolves are visible, this is what you get. And even in the winter, this is what you get. So this has been a sensation, best place in the world to view wolves. You guys know that. That's, that's your business. Um, but to have wolves, you got to kill them. And this is a big issue. If you paid attention to the Montana legislature, the Idaho legislature this last winter, you know this is a big issue. How many wolves is the right amount to have on human-dominated landscapes? How many wolves should be killed each year is a perennial issue that people will debate. However, most would conclude to have wolves, you got to kill them because that creates social tolerance. The, the side of the population that I talked about at the beginning of my talk that doesn't like wolves, 
gets very angry, poaching increases, and they kill them anyway. So reaching that sweet spot between harvest and preservation is tough. This is Wyoming, the last shot was Montana. So this is the hardest part of our world today, compromise. Preservation, no use, conservation, wise use. And that's an important point for wolves right now because sometimes they're shot for no use, just hatred. But they need to be used as a natural resource. And that should help guide the season length uh, and uh, how many wolves are killed. One thing that I've done is uh, I go out to uh, uh, hunting camps. This is Shoshone National Forest and talk with hunters who are hunting primarily elk about wolf recovery, because quite often they're not happy about wolves coming back and eating elk alongside people eating elk. And so this is some of the public outreach that we think is important. But keep in mind, here we are. 2021, we are better off now in terms of large carnivores than we were in Yellowstone in 1872, or arguably any other time in our entire history. Cougars were eliminated, wolves were eliminated, uh, bear numbers were reduced, um, coyotes were eliminated almost, there's probably a few still around, but now all those populations are protected and restored, so we're as good as we've ever been that's hard to say in this day and age when most environmental indicators are declining. But attitudes haven't completely changed. Uh, for those of you who have uh, sat through my talks before, I've showed this slide before because it's disturbing. I don't think this is the way forward, okay? Wolf management doesn't have to be based on anger and hatred. We can do better than this. Uh, not complete uh, elimination again, a regulated controlled hunt. And so really, what can we conclude after this first 25 years? Well, for one, wolves have been a worldwide uh, sensation in terms of viewing and research. We've really been in advance what we know about wolves worldwide. And, and long-term research is the key to understanding. And most studies are three to five years. We are entering our 27th year, and this is very rare. A lot of people say to me, don't you know where they go by now? Uh, no, what our book shows you, what we're learning now, is we're really uncovering more that helps us manage the park, it helps us manage wolves outside the park, uh, it helps us coexist. And really, in this day and age, and really what the National Park Service represents is the preservation of nature. And large carnivores are part of that, wolves are high profile, we, we've got to cash that in and use it to our benefit. And so there is a glimmer of hope that yellow has come down into Yellowstone. You can see the Mexican wolf is kind of plodding along too, uh, slowly to recovery. The lake states are coming back too. There's problems in all the areas, but we can work them out. And how you work them out is through understanding and stories. No one ever made a decision because of a number. They need a story. That's your job, to tell the stories of these wolves. Happy to talk about that with you. Wouldn't you like to know her story that was taken in the heart of Yellowstone with a remote camera? Look at those eyes. Wouldn't you like to know? Isn't it nice to have scenes like that back after a 70 year absence, probably longer, because we started killing them in 1872 and they weren't gone to 1926. They're persecuted everywhere. Yellowstone is a sanctuary. Isn't that a feel good thing just to see a site like that? And is it really wilderness? Is it really a park? Can you call it pristine? Can you call it an intact ecosystem if it doesn't have all of the native species here like wolves? That's all I have. Thank you very much.